I've been using MAME for quite a while to do all of my screenshots, but back when I first started using Linux, it wasn't actually like that. Back then, I was actually using Flameshot, and the reason why I stopped using it is kind of dumb. Basically, the reason why I stopped is because I didn't read the documentation and didn't realize there was a way to set it up to actually run on a key binding. So back then, I had to always just go click little icon in my system tray and then take a screenshot like that, which is obviously really inconvenient and doesn't really make taking screenshots an easy thing to do. But it turns out you can actually key bind it. And besides that, it's actually a really, really powerful screenshotting application. So the reason why I'm even looking for a replacement to MAME anyway is that it has some tiny issues. The first one being is that the transparent overlay that it has is affected by my compositor. And because I have my compositor enabled to do blur, well, what's going to happen is that transparent overlay is going to be set to blur instead. So my entire screen just goes blurry. Now this can be fixed by just disabling my compositor, but if I want to take a screenshot of my desktop, I probably want to take a screenshot in the form that I normally use it. Now, if that was the only thing and there was a way to fix that, there might be a way, I'm not really sure how, probably finding the window name of that transparent overlay, but I have no idea what that would be or how to find it because you can't click on it because you can't open up Xprop while you're doing that. If that was the only thing and I could fix that, that would be one thing. But the other thing that MAME doesn't do is unlike every single other good screenshot application under the sun, it doesn't freeze the screen when you try to take a screenshot. So what it does is it just puts that overlay there. And then if you want to click on stuff or say you try to take a screenshot of a drop down menu, and as soon as you click on the screen, the drop down menu closes. Well, you can't take that screenshot because it closes when you try to click off of it to take the screenshot. Whereas with something like Flameshot, it will take, I guess, a temporary screenshot and then you can pick and choose what you actually want to actually include in your proper screenshot, which makes it much easier, especially for things like fast moving environments. Say you're trying to do like a game screenshot. You can't really do a game screenshot if you don't have that temporary screenshot first, unless you're going to just take, I guess, a, a full window screenshot. But if you want to take a little part of the screen, well, you can't do that without first pausing the screen because otherwise the thing you're trying to take a screenshot of is just going to move out of your way. Okay, so that's enough rambling. So let's see what Flameshot can actually do. Now, the first thing you're going to want to do is make sure that Flameshot is running in the background. And this is why I had a bit of confusion back when I was first using Flameshot, because when you just run the Flameshot application, as we just did then, it doesn't actually launch up, say, like the, the GUI selector thing. What it actually does is just launches up the application in the background so you can easily load it up whenever you need it. So what you can do there is have it launched in your XNetRC or whatever Wayland uses or maybe your BSPWM config or whatever your desktop environment uses. Whatever it is that you use to auto launch applications, just run a flame shot and that's going to have it opened up in the background. Now what you have to do from this point is if you just have the default settings, it will add something to your system tray. But let's say you have it configured like I do, or you just don't have a system tray. Okay, so what we can do from here is if we go into my terminal and then just run a flame shot dash H. Now what this is going to do is just show us some of the arguments we can pass in. So we have GUI, screen, full and config. Now I'll go into the other ones in just a bit. But for now, what we're going to do is run flame shot GUI, which is going to start a manual capture in GUI mode. So this is going to be the select a portion of the screen that you actually want to take a screenshot of. So flame shot GUI, no dashes or anything like that, just flame shot GUI. Okay. Now, as you can see, it's basically just paused my screen. Now on my screen, what I see on my second monitor is my OBS is frozen, but the recording is still going just fine. What it's basically done is taken a temporary screenshot of my entire desktop. So let's say we wanted to take a screenshot of, I don't know, this line right here and also the arch logo. Okay. Now, what we have here is a couple of different things we can do. So if I just right click, what this is going to do is open up a color wheel. So what the color wheel is, is basically going to select the color we're using for things like the pencil tool or the line tool or any of the drawing tools. And I didn't mention that earlier. Flameshot is more than just a screenshotting application. It'll also let you actually annotate the screenshots as well. So let's just go with red. And then if we go and use my scroll wheel, what this is going to do is let us actually select the size of the thing we want to actually draw with. So let's just go size three. 
Now, if we want to start drawing, all we have to do is select the tool we want to use. So let's use something like the pencil tool, and the pencil tool should be pretty straightforward. Basically, it's a pencil like you'd see in any sort of drawing application. Now, the line tool, this is going to be just for straight lines, so we can just put a big X here, and if we just make a line here, as you're going to see, it's anchored to this point right here, and then we can just drag the line however we want. And let's go with the arrow. The arrow is also going to be anchored to a point, but this one actually has, you know, an arrow on it as well. So let's clean some of this stuff up by just pressing Control Z. And let's just say we want to point an arrow at this bit right here because we're saying, hey, look, the dash H bit is pretty useful. And let's also put a box around the flame shot bit. As you can see, with the box tool, that basically just adds a box around it, or we can use the rectangle tool, which can be used to basically hide something. So let's just hide out the flame shot options. Okay. Let's say instead of using this box here, we decided, okay, instead of the box, we want a circle instead. Well, we can use the circle tool for that and put a bit of a circle around that. And let's also get rid of this arrow. So let's put a circle around that and point the arrow to this instead. All right. And let's say the H is still important here, but instead of having it be pointed at, this time let's actually put a marker over it. So let's change the color to be something like green. And then we can just highlight over that. Now the problem with the marker tool is the marker tool actually is anchored to a point. So it's basically just the line tool, but with some transparency added to it. And the problem with this is I kind of like my markers to be sort of like the pencil tool. So let's just make that a bit thicker. And that should be enough. Yeah, as I said, I kind of like my markers to be like the pencil tool, so I can sort of just like draw as I want with the marker. It's not a big deal, but it is something I do like to see just in case you want to do something like I want to mark, I don't know, in some sort of arc here or something like that. You can't really do that. You can sort of just do it with straight lines, but it's not really the same sort of thing. It's okay, and it's fine for most situations, but I would like to see a pencil tool version as well. Now, the other thing we have in here is text. Text obviously should work as text always does. So let's just start writing something in here like hello world, and the color that's being used for this is decided by this wheel as well. So as we select different colors in here, Basically, it changes the color of the text. And the text size is decided by this thing up the top here as well. Now, one thing you can't do is you can't go and actually set the font. It's not that big of a deal, but you can't actually do it. The next tool we have is the blur tool, which should be pretty straightforward. It's basically the filled in rectangle tool, but this time, instead of putting a color there, it's just going to blur something. Now, it's not the best blur. You can still kind of see what's going on, so you might want two layers of it, especially if it's something that's important that you don't want to see. If it's sort of just you want to hide it, one layer is fine, but I can still read what's there even without knowing what was originally there. So two layers is probably better if you do properly want to hide something. And if you just keep going, eventually it's going to create some dark void that nothing will ever escape from. But hey, that's uh, something you can have fun with off camera. The next one we have is basically just the size of the screenshot. I don't know why this is treated as a button. You can't click on it or anything. It's just, this is what the size is. And the next one is just actually move around this selection. So let's say we don't need this Hello World anymore, but we'll just leave the text there. We just want to move this box to this point down here. And then let's also say we want to resize the box, and that can be done with this tool as well. So just drag that to be, I don't know, this right here or something like that. Cool. And we also have the back tool, but we can do that with Control Z and the forward tool or the redo tool, which is done with Control Shift Z. And the other ones in here, so we can copy this image to our clipboard. So if we just go and do that now, let's go and paste that in something like my Discord server. As you can see, it tried to paste that screenshot in, or let's go back and take another screenshot and then select something else. And let's say instead we just want to save it to our file system. So if we just go save the capture, what that's going to do is just bring up a file selector. Now I believe this is the Qt file selector. So I mainly use GTK stuff. That's why it's just not themed correctly. And I'm not really sure how to do a global Qt theme. So if someone knows how to do that, then that would be really useful. So let's go and just set a name for this, say, I don't know, uh, terminal screenshot or something like that. Then that has been saved. And now let's actually go and find that. So if we just go into my screenshots folder 
and we search for terminal screenshot. There we go, it's down the bottom here. Open that up. As you can see, it's taken a screenshot just fine. Now there were two other save methods as well, so let's go and look at those ones. So let's just take a screenshot of that. And as we can see, there is a sort of upload to the cloud. And what this one is going to do is upload the selection to Imga. Now, I believe you're going to need to actually be logged into Imga to actually do this. But let's go and upload that. And it's going to try to upload the image. Now, if we go over to open URL, what that's going to do is just show us where that's actually being saved to. And if we go back to the interface, we can just go and delete the image or we can copy it to our clipboard or we can copy the URL. Now, I'm just going to delete the image because I don't actually need it. And that's going to take you over to Imga to go and delete it. I'm just going to say yes. And there we go. The image has now been deleted. Now, the last thing we actually have is actually pretty neat. So let's go and take a screenshot of this bit right here. Cool. And let's go and click the pin option. Now, this other option we have here is choose an app to open the capture with. So that'll let you open it with like an image selector or with your web browser, things like that. But what I've found is... For whatever reason, my image viewer doesn't actually come up in the list and my image viewer is SXIV. So I don't know what's going on with that. It might be a problem with SXIV itself, but you can't just run arbitrary commands from this menu. So I can't actually use it. So I'm not going to bother showing you that. But if we go and click on the pin option, this one is actually kind of neat. So what this does now, it looks a little bit funky because let me in a tiling window manager, but what this has basically done is taken a screenshot and then stuck it in a window. And the reason why the rest of this is blurred is because basically the window containing this is trying to take up the entire screen. But let's just turn it into a floating window. And as you're going to see, it's just a window that contains that screenshot. So say you need to have a temporary screenshot for some reason. This is a way you could do that. Besides that, I don't really know why you would ever bother doing this. It seems like a really weird feature to do most of the time. Maybe if you want to have a screenshot sticky note or something like that, I guess that's a thing you could do. But besides that, I don't really see much of a purpose of this feature. It is neat though, and if someone does have a cool use for it, then be sure to let me know. Now, there are a few other arguments we can pass into Flameshot as well. So if we just run Flameshot dash H again, as we're going to see, we have things like the screen option, full and config. Now, I'll leave config to last because the next two we're going to cover are two other screenshot methods. So if we just do flame shot screen, what that's going to do is take a screenshot of a single screen, but it doesn't actually work out of the box. What you have to do is define the path you want to save to or print out the raw PNG or save it to your clipboard. Now, I'm just going to save it as a file. So if we just run Flameshot again, but this time pass in the dash P option, and let's just save it in my pictures directory in the screenshots directory. And we go and do this now. What that's gonna do is take a screenshot of the desktop that my cursor is currently on. So in this case, it'll be a screenshot of desktop one. Now, if we go and look over here, as we can see, we have a screenshot of that desktop. But let's say we want a screenshot of my second desktop instead, or I guess my second monitor, not my second desktop. Those technically mean a slightly different thing. So if this time we go and pass in the dash N option and we pass in two. So what that's going to do is take a screenshot of my second monitor and we run this again. And as you can see, it's successfully taken the screenshot and go over here, open this up and... For whatever reason, that seems to have taken a screenshot of my entire desktop. Now, I haven't ever seen that happen. That's a little bit bizarre. I did definitely run the right command, yeah? Yes, okay. Uh, I don't know why that has actually happened. So if I go and run this command on my second desktop, so I'll just go and put that over there now and run the previous one that we ran. So just take a screenshot of the desktop my cursor is currently on. As you'll see, cool. The notification popped up and if we go over here now that's taken a screenshot of my second desktop but for whatever reason the dash n2 seems to not work for some reason that is a little bit bizarre i don't know why that happens hmm so if you need to take a screenshot with the delay so let's say you want to take a screenshot but you don't want to take it now you want to take it in two seconds because you need to set something up what you can do is use the dash D option and then pass in the number of milliseconds you want to wait. Now, if you want to take a screenshot of your entire desktop, so not just your current monitor, but 
every single monitor you currently have plugged in, what you can do is use the full option instead. So flame shot full dash P and then save it into my screenshots directory. Run this, give it a second, notification popped up. And over here, that'll be this image right here. As you can see, that is another screenshot of my entire desktop. Now, I don't know why I acted weirdly with screen. I didn't actually see that off camera. Honestly, what I saw off camera was screen wasn't actually working. So for whatever reason, screen has now started working. I'm not too sure what's going on there. One thing that I should mention is that all of the arguments available for the screen argument, except for the dash N option, are available for the full argument as well. So if we just run flame shot full with no options passed in, as you can see, same options except the dash N option. Now the last thing we have is flame shot config. And what this is gonna do is open up the configuration interface. Now, one thing that I would probably do is go and disable the things that you don't actually need, just so you can go and sort of unclutter the interface. So let's say you don't need to see like the selection size, for example, you can go and untick that, or you don't need the image uploader, or you don't need, I don't know, the exit button because you can exit by just pressing escape. So you can go and disable what you don't need, or you can actually go and enable everything. So by default, I think text and pin are disabled. I don't know why those are disabled, but I think by default, those ones actually were. And the other stuff we have is we can set the opacity. So let's say we want to set the opacity to something like 10% or yeah, we go 10%. And let's just take another screenshot. As you can see, it's much lighter now, or we can go all the way down to zero. And that's basically just going to put that interface on the screen without actually messing with the opacity. Or you can go all the way to the other direction and set it to 100% and just have a black screen except for what you actually go and select. So we can go and select, say, this part here. Personally, I'm not a fan of this because it makes taking the screenshot way harder than it actually needs to be. So I would like to have it around something like 60 or 70%, just so it's hiding a bit of the background, but you can actually still see what's going on. I think this looks the best doing it like this but that's really up to what you want to do. And over here we have basically a way that we can go and configure the file name. So basically the way the file name is being set up is based on the current date. And you can go and configure exactly how you want that to be set up. So say you want something like, we want year, minute, full date, year, or something weird like that. You can go and configure that like that. Now that's a weird setup to have, but if you want to do it like that, there's no reason why you can't do that. And then the final screen is just the general settings. So things like show that help message at the start. So if we go and disable this and take another screenshot, as you're gonna see that blue window at the start doesn't actually pop up. And this is probably a better way to do it anyway, just so you don't have to wait for that to show up. So we can take a screenshot here and it still works as we would expect it to. And you can go and disable the desktop notifications. Now I do like these enabled, just so I can be certain that the image actually has been saved we can go and show or hide the tray icon. As you can see, the icon has now popped up or we can go and you know hide that like I normally have it and it goes and disappears. And launch at startup, I don't know how well this will work. I think this might work in some desktop environments, but when you just have everything set up yourself within a window manager, this probably isn't going to work as nicely, but it might try to run like a system D job or something in the background. I'm not entirely sure how this is actually going to launch startup. One thing I did skip over is over on the first screen, you can actually go and configure the color of the interface. I believe by default it's set to like a purple, but I prefer it to be blue. So I have gone and changed that. Now, if you wanna go and change the config file, which has everything that's in here, plus a little bit extra, if we go into the .config directory, so .config and go into the darkl directory, so that is darkl with a capital D, because why not? That is the developer of the application. Don't ask me why it's set up like that. It just kind of is. And then into the flameshot.ini file. Now, as you can see, some of this stuff you don't really want to configure by hand. For example, the buttons. Don't try to configure this by hand because you'll probably go and break something. But if you want to go and configure something like the contrast color, because there's a spelling mistake in the variables, this is the... Uh, the dark color I have, you can go and configure that in here, or you can go and configure the UI color, show help, set the save path, so on and so forth. So if you want to go and get this installed, it's available on most distros in the standard repo. So on Arch Linux, that would be sudo pacman-s flame shot. 
And I presume it's very similar on any of the Debian-based distros or Void Linux or Gen 2 or really anything that you're on. It's probably going to be available in your standard repos because Flameshot is actually a really popular application. So I think that's pretty much everything I want to talk about. I'm probably going to keep using Flameshot as my main screenshotting application because it does address some of those little problems I did have with MAME. As you saw, I had my compositor running the entire time, but it wasn't blurring my screen, which is much nicer to see and just makes it much easier to use. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. But before I go, I want to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim Craig, Nathan, Andrew Montes, Arpiro Di, Rode, Tony, Donald, John Spagin, Thais, and Zilva. If you want to support the channel, there'll be some links down below, as well as my Amazon affiliate links where you can buy the gearies in this channel or anything else you want. And I'll get a small kickback for it. Awesome, go check out my podcast. That is Tech of a Tea, available on Library, YouTube, and some other platforms as well. There'll be links down below. And if you're watching this on YouTube, it's also available on Library, BitTube, and BitChute as well. So be sure to go check those out if you don't want to be using YouTube. And I think that's pretty much everything for me. Remember to smash the like button, leave me a comment down below, and remember to subscribe and ding the bell icon down below as well. Also, I'm now blogging on Minds and Read.Cash. So if you want more from me and you kind of want just the rambly nonsense but in text form, then go check those out. So I think that's pretty much everything for me and... I'm out.